Welcome. We're going to do a walking tour of Louisville's Main Street beginnings. Now, this is where Louisville had its pioneer origins. This is a place that pioneers sniffed out as unusually high ground. You know, during the great flood in the Ohio River Valley in 1937, these basements might have taken on water, but this was, at least on the surface, part of City Island, a serpent-shaped island in downtown Louisville that didn't get wet. This is the area where the early pioneers designated it as the main street, extra wide and at the high bank of the Ohio River. We're going to look at old and new. We can't look at the whole thing. We're going to begin here at 3rd Street and go down to Roy Wilkins Boulevard. Now, that's old 9th Street. And we're going to see this delightful blend of old and new. Main Street's always been a changing. And we're going to focus on that area where Louisville had its pioneer beginnings. So let's head out. First, here on this corner is an old bank from 1890. This bank building was built for $100,000. There was on the opposite corner, it's gone now, the 1832 Bank of the United States. Next to it, headed east on the north side, was the beginning in the 1840s of the W.B. Belknap Wholesale Hardware Company. The Board of Trade Building was at this corner over on the other side of the street. So there's plenty to read here early in the beginnings of Louisville. Let's move on down Main Street and see what we find. This street, in fact, has a series of stages in its life. Early pioneer wooden stockades, Louisville's beginnings, gave way to brick and frame residential structures and then smaller scale commercial buildings, wholesale and retail, and then larger scale wholesale commercial warehouses. Now the Bank of Louisville anchors the Actors Theater lobby. And this bank was chartered in reaction to the control of Biddle's Philadelphia United States Bank. This was currency and capital generated for the interior west. This building was built in 1837. Gideon Chirac, now that's the guy who actually was the architect on our Jefferson County Courthouse, who designed Morrison Hall at Transylvania University in Lexington. He was the construction superintendent, actually the construction superintendent on this bank building in 1837. It's one of the oldest buildings still standing in downtown Louisville. It served a bank inside the door, and through the window you can see the egg-shaped window at the top of the atrium. That egg-shaped window provided natural light for the counting room floor in the old Bank of Louisville from 1837. By the way, this was the block when Louisville's pioneer founder, George Rogers Clark, he had his leg removed at a doctor's office in this block in 1809. There was a drummer and a fife player playing music to try to distract, I am sure, the significantly inebriated George Rogers Clark during this amputation process. The Galleria, it's three blocks that way. You're headed that way. Three sharp blocks. Mm -hmm. Let's go ahead and cross this way. Main Street was where all of the newcomers, whether they came in chains, or they came as poverty-stricken European immigrants, or if they came even with better times, they came up the riverbank to Main Street, the high bank of the river. By the way, this part of 4th Street was historically called Wall Street, and it led down to the main wharf, where the steamboats were parked in historic Louisville. Now, this is the cornerstone for one of Louisville's earliest, tallest buildings. It was called the Commerce Building when it was built in 1890, later renamed the Columbia Building. 
the developers wanted to build what they believed was the tallest building south of the Ohio River in the United States. This community has used and abused the Ohio River. It's always had a strong back and carried heavy loads. We have probably underappreciated her beauty. This Belvedere Plaza of 1970 represents an effort to take us from the Central Business District over an old railroad track through an undeveloped area of land at the time over an emerging interstate expressway and out to the river's edge so you can spit in the river on a Saturday night. And so this is the Belvedere Plaza that was built in order to connect the central business district to the river's edge so that we can enjoy her beauty. This is what I call the Be Wise, Be Insured building. Dinwiddie Lampton's American Life and Accident Company. They hired the firm out of Chicago of Mies van der Rohe. This van der Rohe project is built in Corton steel. Now, I've got a picture for you. This steel is designed never to be painted, but it captures a dream that we can all share, and that is it will grow more beautiful as it rusts away. There are plenty of people still sharing doubts about that beauty. But I'm telling you, there is color in that rust under certain light and certain conditions. The Galt House Hotel. Jiminy Crickets. You know, we've had a Galt House in this city back to the very earliest days. It was in the 1830s, early 1830s, that up at 2nd and Main, on the northeast corner, there was a physician in town who lived on that corner at 2nd and Main. His name was Dr. William Galt. He had a nice home, but with a great feature of his home is he had terraced gardens out back that stepped down to the Ohio River behind his house. Well, when they took Dr. Galt's corner and built a hotel in the 1830s, they named it the Galt House. That first Galt House Hotel burned in the last months of the Civil War. The cascading waters obviously suggest the reason for Louisville's beginning, the falls, the rapids of the Ohio. In the 981 mile length of the Ohio River, there is only one major natural obstruction to navigation and it happens to be at mile 603, right here at Louisville, the falls of the Ohio. This site reminds us of where Louisville literally began. Louisville began in the darkest days of the American Revolution, when that Virginia militia captain who had already been out this way sniffing around for commercial futures in the emerging frontier west. George Rogers Clark went to the revolutionary governor of Virginia, Patrick Henry, and said, can I round up volunteer soldiers, militia, who I can take to the strategic falls of the Ohio and build a defensive fort on an island that used to be out in the Ohio River called Corn Island. Corn Island's now dead and gone. Clark rounded up 150 volunteer soldiers and 60 civilians, an African-American slave, moms, kids, a brother-in-law, a preacher, and an adventurer. And they came in a flotilla of flatboats landing on Corn Island on May 27, 1778. That was Louisville's beginning. They erected a wooden stockade out on that island. One day, in the summer of 78, Clark was drilling his troops on the island, preparing them for defense, they thought. He pulled a second set of secret orders from his pocket, and he said, gentlemen, Governor Patrick Henry has authorized me, if I think it's appropriate, not to defend here at Corn Island, but to attack the British-held fortresses in the Northwest. 
the Northwest in those days happened to be Indiana and Illinois. The British held fortresses of Kaskaskia, Cahokia, and you've heard of Vincennes. And so Clark told that to his soldiers and some of those early patriots started swimming for sure. He rounded some up, a few perished in the wilderness, but nevertheless, Clark proceeded with an invasion of the Northwest, becoming the George Washington of the West. He conquered those three forts with the British and their Indian allies. You know what that means to you? It means that today you can drive to Indianapolis or Chicago without going through customs because he effectively, by invading from Corn Island in 78 and 79, pushed the boundary of the emerging nation to the Great Lakes rather than the, you ought to be looking into Canada over there in Clarksville and Jeffersonville. But instead, that's part of the United States. So Clark launched his invasion from here of the West and he began Louisville in 1778. With the story of the troops swimming for shore, you know what I believe Clark is saying as he looks over his shoulder? I think he's looking at those reluctant patriots and he's saying, are you all coming? I'm convinced. George Rogers Clark and Louisville's beginning. This is the Kentucky Center for the Arts. It's a center of performance, all right. Ballet and orchestra, Broadway series, children's theater. Many, many, many other performances take place in this state finance building. But another exciting feature of this Main Street building is that it is also a public space for exhibiting modern sculpture, all of which has been privately donated. This is the American sculptor's piece, Alexander Calder. It's called the Red Feather. Come up the steps and let me show you one of my very favorites. I want to put my arms completely around all of the feelings of emotion that these two pieces of sculpture convey to us. How exciting can life really get? And all of us have known the hard times and the struggles of this figure here. And all of us have known at some time what it's like to feel like our life is a jigsaw puzzle that the pe and the pieces have just been scattered aimlessly on the table. And when those pieces come back together, we feel whole again. Jean de Buffet's Percival and Feribilis. This Kentucky Center has one other major feature. It's what I call a night vista. If I brought my Aunt Maud from Des Moines here at night, I believe when she looks out that window, she's going to believe she's really been somewhere. That's the National City Tower on the left. It was designed by Harrison and Abramovitz. That's the architectural firm that did the United Nations building in Manhattan. But it is a pretty straightforward black box of the 1970s era. You know what I call it? I call it the Hershey Bar building because it looks like a Hershey Bar to me. <laughs> but probably Louisville's grandest architectural uh, piece is visible straight out the window and it's wonderful lighted at night. This is Michael Graves' 1985 piece, the Humana Office Tower. It was done after a complex architectural competition in which five major architects in the world were invited to submit designs. Humana chose Michael Graves of Princeton, New Jersey. He's on the Princeton University faculty there and has done the post office in Portland, Oregon, and many, many, many other buildings around this nation. It's postmodern architecture. It has a traditional element, but at the same time, it sure does reflect Louisville. You look up at the very top and you can see the bridge girders suggestive of bridges across the Ohio River. And when you listen carefully, that covered front porch there on the front has cascading water down an entire front wall. I can, in my imagination, hear as early visitors did to our city of Louisville, hear 
the murmuring waters of the falls of the Ohio, water cascading through those giant pieces of limestone at the falls of the Ohio before we tamed her in the 1920s. That sound, when the wind was blowing right and when the water was the correct amount, it is told by reporters that you could hear the waters of the falls of the Ohio as far south as Chestnut Street. Our uptown hotels didn't need Muzak or a massage bed to help you get to sleep. You could hear the murmur of the falls of the Ohio. The grand claim is that we are now entering the second largest collection of cast iron commercial architecture in the nation. It is alleged that this collection is second only to that which is found in the Soho district of Manhattan in New York City. Regardless of the accuracy of that claim, this is a monumental collection of cast iron commercial buildings from that period of 1850 to the turn of the century in 1900. What do I mean by cast iron? Well, you slap a magnet upon this baby and it sticks. This is the same stuff, by the way, that you used to scramble eggs in before you got your cholesterol reading. It's just that old black skillet cast iron poured into a decorative mold. Why cast iron? A couple of reasons. The Victorians loved to play dress up. And cast iron gave the Victorians the chance to play dress up at a price that was cheaper than stone. They embellished the facades of their buildings with all kinds of ornamentation that you could order from a catalog just sitting at the kitchen table with your architect. So one of the reasons the Victorians, the princes of commerce and industry, dressed up their buildings was they were Victorians for real, but they also knew the value of a signature office wholesale building. They could literally take this highly ornamented facade and emboss it on a letterhead. Another reason for cast iron, this is not a load-bearing wall, so it allowed a grand open window space for natural light into the offices, warehouses, ordering department, and light manufacturing and shipping receiving departments for these wholesalers, mostly on Maine. So, oh, by the way, they also thought they were fireproof by using cast iron. Wrong, McGee. You get these babies hot enough and this iron will melt just like it did before. Now, when you're looking at this grand district, the Main, West Main Street Preservation District, those people who have recently redesigned the street have made it easy. Say you're down here with Aunt Maud and you forgot your magnet. See the dark bricks on the sidewalk? They point to those buildings that are of cast iron. They've also done some additional interpretation for you. Come over here to the tree guards around the street. We're going to see a lot of them on Main Street. They are used to tell a historic story. The developers of West Main, they commissioned regional artists, and the regional artists designed a walking stick that told a story. And then, in printed form, they tell the fuller story on the band that binds the three walking sticks around the tree. This is a wonderful way to tell even more of the story of historic West Main. You know what this tells us? This tells us about the visit to Louisville of Scrooge's daddy. Here in 1842, Charles Dickens, right here. He was here as a visitor in 1842, back again in the 1860s, but this is the 1842 visit. You know what he wrote from London in the book he published the next year? He said, I stayed at the Galt House Hotel, more handsomely appointed than any place this side of Paris, and I was staying hundreds of miles beyond the Alleghenies. He also took a stagecoach to meet his downstream steamboat in the Louisville and Portland Canal between here and Louisville's upper west portion of town. He said, here as elsewhere in these parts, the road was perfectly alive with pigs of all ages. 
fast asleep are grunting about in the search of tidbits. So Dickens saw the elegant Galt house, stayed there all night, and he also described the pigs in Louisville Street. This is Charles Dickens' visit in 1842. You know, one of the things I love about Main Street, I love the orderliness. I love the ornate variations also in that fundamental order of window design as you look across the facade of a building. But as we go down Main Street, look at the many different kinds of decorative lintels above the windows. Oh, I told you that I would talk about Michael Graves and the Humana Building and the challenge that he faced. Michael Graves, in 1985, when he designed the Humana Building, took that massive building and put it at the rear of the lot and then took a piece that he stuck on the front. That's the covered front porch where we heard the water flowing down the interior wall. He took that front porch and put it right out at the street line so that your eye would gently step down from the massing of the building in the rear, gently step down, and then gently step down to the diminutive 19th century structures next to it. One other thing Graves did, look at the facade line, the roof line of that front porch area. It's angled, tilted, just like the angle or the tilt of the 19th century buildings next to it. Michael Graves knew how to build a giant next to much smaller buildings from the 19th century. By the way, you better get used to this name. You're going to see it repeated a lot. There were a lot of, of iron foundries in Louisville, and they manufactured a lot of this decorative cast iron. They did manhole covers, coal hole covers. They did decorative facades and they did splash plates on the front of buildings. Sneed and Company Iron Works, they were located down on Main and over on Market. They were just one of 12 iron foundries in Louisville during the Victorian era. This little setting area has one simple message, and that is all the buildings on West Main are not cast iron. Some are of brick and stone. This poem tells the story delightfully. When trees are three, the building is masonry. Con Martin Company, this is one of my favorites. You talking about fine shoes. They were made here and distributed here from along West Main. And here is the open palm and the shoes gathered together here in the open palm. I want you to meet a friend of mine. He was a Louisville mayor in the late 1940s and the early 1950s. He was a popular, energetic, and imaginative mayor. His name was Charles Farnsley. Here's Charlie sitting on a Main Street bench. Look at his book. He's reading the classics, Plato and Aristotle and other ancient philosophers. You know, Charlie believed that it was possible that you could find inspiration for dealing with city problems by looking back to some of the ancient philosophers and their writings. He's sitting in front of the Fund for the Arts. 50 years ago, Charlie provided the leadership for that public subscription to support the multifarious arts institutions and organizations in our community. So Charlie, sitting here wanting to have a chat with you, is thinking about the city and its future. And he's also remembering the creation of the Fund for the Arts. This series of buildings here in a row, cast iron, head to toe. And it just gives you a feeling for the range of possibilities when all you got to do is bolt the pieces together. For instance, this grand building at 635 is rather simplistic in iron going up its facade, but you step back and you're looking into the mouths at the very top of winged lions. Lions with wings on their ears. 
all part of decorative cast iron. Or look at this baby. Jiminy crickets. The imagination runs rampant at 637. What do you need? The builder of this building surely must have said to his or her architect, well, I'd like some ivy growing up the columns. And then I would like for you just to make a garland of produce from the garden and just string it together around the top of the columns. Not done yet. And I would also like for you to take some corn cobs and to make them the definition between the floors of the building. Just shows you what you can do in cast iron. It's hard for me to say the name, but it was F.W. Johann Broek. He was yet another hat wholesaler here on Main Street, and that story is told for you and Aunt Maud here at the doormat in front of this Main Street old warehouse building. A decorative clock, a decorative clock, Victorian in nature, with kind of a hint of a fleur-de-lis at the very top. But the main message of this intersection at Main and 7th is that we are getting ready to cross the Wilderness Road. That was one of the major ways that pioneers came into Kentucky, either down the Ohio or through the Cumberland Gap. The Wilderness Road branched one to the Bluegrass Settlements, and the one dead ended here. This is 7th Street, but the Wilderness Road, which used to be here, went by way of Bullets Lick, out close to Oklahoma, went to B-A-R-D, Pasta V-S, Bardstown, and then went on toward Cumberland Gap. The Wilderness Road dead ended at a gigantic stockaded, wooden stockade fort that spanned this entire sector here. 1782, we had been here on the island, up on shore briefly at 12th and Rowan, and then to this more permanent defensive fort. It was called Fort Thomas Nelson after our third Virginia governor. Remember, when Louisville began, there was no Kentucky. This was Louisville, Virginia, from almost the very earliest days. And so this is Fort, the site of Fort Thomas Nelson, right here at the end of the Wilderness Road. Now you see that concrete wall back there. That's the beginning of what became a 29 mile long wall around the city of Louisville. I mentioned earlier the 1937 flood when three fourths of the inhabited portion of the city was flooded. Well, this wall, sometimes in concrete and sometimes as an earthen wall, this wall is 29 miles long from the Butchertown neighborhood all the way through Shawnee Park, all the way down to Southwest County at Cosmosdale. It has gates where you close the wall where the streets are. But that's the flood wall. Just beyond the flood wall from 1889, 1890, until the early 1960s was Louisville's second railway passenger station. It was first called Union, but there was another Union station, so we renamed it the Central Passenger Station. There were passenger railway tracks that went all the way out to the river's edge. That passenger station, when it was abandoned in the early 1960s, became Actors Theater's second home before it went up on Main Street. See the hotel over there in gray with the New Orleans style balcony? That was the Garvey's Railroad Hotel. I mentioned Sneed and Company. Now these are replicas of coal hole covers. I call them manholes if you want to, women. <laughs> but nevertheless, this is Sneed and Company Ironworks, and this is a replica. Here in a little bit, we're going to see a whole collection of original coal hole covers. You see, originally in the sidewalk, the coal trucks would open up this hole and pour the coal for the boilers directly into the hole and then back into the basements of the building so they didn't have to run the chute into the building itself. 
So these are decorative cast iron coal hole covers, and this is a replica used around some of the trees on Main Street. This is Harbison and Gathright. They were providers of transportation supplies from the very earlier days of Louisville. There are some 20 condominiums in this building with wonderful views of the falls of the Ohio and the wide Ohio River there. So this is the site of old Harbison and Gathright wholesale transportation parts providers. Oh, you talking about it. We got you covered. Here we've got the needle and the thread for a wholesale clothier. It's H.H. H. Wolf. And look even more closely. We've got a gentleman being measured for a new suit. The tape measure is literally over the clothier's shoulder. Telling you just one more activity here on West Main. This is the Carter Dry Goods Building. This building was done in 1878 for a dry goods wholesaler, C.J. Clark. We're going to see him on Main Street in a little bit. He was the architect, and the cast iron is on the first level only. When the Louisville Science Center came in the late 1970s, in order to suggest more modern times, the glass windows were removed and a more modern interior wall was constructed. Another way to talk about science and its future, Louisville Science Center has elements of the past and elements of the future, is this wonderful set of kinetic sculpture pieces. They suggest the many actions and interactions within nature and physical processes. You even have moving parts. But on the other hand, it looks like you've got a piece of Swiss cheese over here as well. But this is the modern elements of science, the modern elements of science in this old Carter Dry Goods Company. In fact, when C.J. Clark was doing the building, he wrote the name Carter up at the top of the building and decorated the very top with what looked like beehives. Just one more piece of decorative element on Main Street. Talking about hotels, and there were plenty of them on Main Street, here's a way to tell the story. This is the Phoenix Hotel from 1858. What do you see? You see the bellhop and the hotel door key. The artist who was commissioned to do the piece told the story of the Phoenix in this form. But there's another hotel here that was badly damaged in a great storm of 1890, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. It was the Alexander's Hotel, so says the doormat. So we are now coming to 8th Street on West Main. This is the Fort Nelson building, but the problem is that Fort Nelson itself, as you know, was one block further east. But this is what became known as the Fort Nelson building. This building has been abandoned for many years, and we're hoping it's making a grand comeback. This corner tells another story. I mentioned a little earlier that storm of March 27, 1890. It was called the Whirling Tiger of the Air. And this monument reminds us of the tornado of 1890, when a great storm whipped out of the west tore down buildings in downtown Parkland, a neighborhood in the west, came through this area, knocked down the buildings on the corner, tore down buildings and destroyed or heavily damaged buildings in this area, knocked down the railroad sheds behind the 700 block of Maine, bounced off of Jeffersonville, and knocked down the water tower on Zorn Avenue up on the river two or three miles. That was the great tornado of 1890. This whirling figure reminds us of that, and these etched photos show you of the damage that was done here on West Main by the tornado of 1890. I called it the whirling tiger of the air. That's what the newspapers call it. Let me show you the tiger. The tiger is literally chasing and gnarling at the buildings on West Main. You see the tiger's tail? Here's the whirling tiger of the air 
going after the buildings on West Main, March 27, 1890. Transportation is back, in this case, for over a century. Fulton Conway, still here, has been in the transportation providing business. This building in white was originally four stories tall, but the act of God of 1890 took off the top two stories from the Fulton Conway building. Louisville was the nation's leading manufacturer of blue jeans before blue jeans got popular. Here is a Main Street manufacturer of blue jeans in 1890. Tap Leathers and Company. Louisville was the nation's biggest manufacturer of blue jeans. Ah, Louisville Distillers. They've been regulated in Louisville since 1780. Here's a stack of barrels. There were many, many distilling headquarters. Sometimes the distilleries would be in Nelson County or Anderson County or in outer Jefferson County, but the corporate offices were frequently and distribution centers were frequently here on Maine, a stack of barrels. John Bull made a fortune in Louisville selling snake oil, John Bull's patent medicine. And this is where it was centered. Got old John and the Bull standing side by side here on Main Street. Now, I can't mention all of the artists who did the tree guards, but here is an artist that you're probably familiar with. This is the piece is celebrating old John Bull himself, and it's done by the African-American sculptor who is internationally famous, Ed Hamilton from Louisville here. And here is the bottle of John Bull's patent medicine. Another local sculptor that you've heard of, who's now deceased, who's done a lot of work in Louisville, did the piece that's at the next tree guard. And that's the famous Louisville sculptor, Barney Bright. He did the story of Louisville's first steam railway, which very quickly became our first streetcar. Look, this is Barney Bright's piece celebrating the Louisville and Portland Railroad Company. Look at the engineer playfully looking out of the steam locomotive window and the tracks descending down to the ground. Oh, this is how it happened. Lexington had grown much more dramatically than Louisville in the first five decades. The only problem, when the steamboat came to town, Lexington had the misfortune of not being on navigable water. So that city in desperation, as she, as she watched Louisville grow dramatically, powered by steamboats, Lexington turned to the latest technology, the steam locomotive. She planned a railroad called the Lexington and Ohio River that would go from the bluegrass, connect to the Ohio River, and bypass Louisville, below the falls of the Ohio. So she planned her rail line, started building it on that end, bluegrass end, and the far western terminus from, from Portland around toward Lexington and bypassing Louisville. Only problem, the panic, the economic panic of 1837 came along and the railroad company went into foreclosure. Guess who bailed them out? Louisville merchants with the understanding that the Lexington and Ohio had to go from Portland to Louisville and then to Lexington. They laid tracks from 6th and Main down to the Portland Wharf and in 1838 put a steam locomotive, a small steam locomotive on those tracks. Guess what? Main Street merchants went to court. The steam horse was frightening the horse flesh. And so the judge ruled that they had to jerk the locomotive off the track and they replaced it with a stagecoach on wheels pulled by mules. Louisville's first streetcar ran from 6th and Main 
to the Portland Wharf on the tracks of the Lexington and Ohio Railway Company. In fact, the tracks here in the sidewalk remind us of that fact. These are the tracks where that first steam locomotive and then the rail and then the streetcar, I don't know that these are the actual tracks, but they remind us of that Lexington and Ohio. In fact, after the Civil War, railroads became so important to our city, the steam locomotive became literally the symbol of the city. And so you see the word progress and the symbol of the city of Louisville in this manhole cover here on West Main. Now down here at the corner of 9th was the corner saloon. So here was Joseph Jan, Joseph John saloon. The figure shows a person trying to drink it by the barrel full here at the corner saloon on West Main. And a liquor wholesaler comes next. Albert C. Camp Liquors. And I don't know whether the gentleman is trying to wrestle demon rum or whether that's the symbol of Bach beer. But either way, he's trying to wrestle the billy goat to the ground. Notice one of the features of Main Street that delights me is trying to read in faded letters old signs that are still on walls of building. There you can see the name Fort Nelson Wholesale. And with additional research, I'm sure we could peel back additional letters from layers of wall signs, billboards, that have been on that wall. The Kentucky Mirror Works, now with a somewhat more formal name, has been in business since 1905. From 1931, this company, just coincidentally, has had as their advertising symbol a baseball shattering a window. That was the symbol of this company that's now adjacent to the Louisville Slugger Bat from 1931 forward. So now they have put that baseball going through the plate glass window on their building in grandiose form in scale that would reflect the Hillerkin Bradsby Louisville Slugger Museum bat that we're going to see next door. C.I. Caulfield, that's Columbus I. Caulfield, they did pumps here on West Main at one point. And so here you see in the doormat, pumps. And then, of course, Fall City Clothing, with their sign on the side, still in faded paint, hand machined. And here are the gentlemen making clothes, wholesale clothes, here in Louisville. Now, this is a new building on Main, made to look like the old picket tobacco warehouse building that was demolished to build the Louisville Slugger Bat Factory, the Louisville Slugger Museum, and in this building on Historic Main, the Hillerican Bradsby Company, the makers of the Louisville Slugger Bat, have their corporate offices. And so this complex is both old and new. Let me point out some of the decorative features of this new complex. Those are the baseball pennants over on the fence. Here in the driveway, in pavers is a giant baseball. And then that massive metal replica of two scale, 120 feet tall. You know, I'm not one to brag a lot about my city, but I tell you, we surely have got the world's biggest baseball bat. Can't you agree on that? This is a replica of a Babe Ruth bat made by the Hillary and Bradsby Company that's been a Louisville landmark since the 1880s. Now, they took their bat factory and went to southern Indiana for a little while, but they're back here now on Main Street. Among the other features of the museum building, you can see etched in, in glass, the male and the female power hitters. They're etched in glass. Remember, this tobacco warehouse from the 1850s that was demolished was virtually this exact scale. And so 
the Pickett Tobacco Warehouse from 1850 to the 1990s was on this corner. Around the corner, there are some other playful features with the museum and the bat factory. Let me show you. Look, the city made the sidewalk cuts for the trees in the shape of home plate. You talking about cast iron. Here's where cast iron West Main Street is celebrated in all of its grandness. This building is the Heart Block, Heart Wholesale Hardware, celebrated in this tree guard with the various hardware supplies sold from West Main here. Well, I see a water spigot, I see a wrench, I see a hammer, I see a paintbrush and a paint can. I see what might look like um, little dies that are used in other wholesale hardware parts. That looks like a chisel. All of these things are celebrated here in the tree guard. The building, designed by architect Charles D. Myers and built in 1884. This building is the grandest of all of the cast iron on West Main. Decorative cast iron from head to toe. And I promised you, the Museum of Coal Hole Covers. The 12 foundries in Louisville that were making decorative cast iron in many forms, there's a book, a national book published on coal hole covers. And it is said that Louisville has one of the grandest collection of coal hole covers in the whole nation. Some claim to fame. Tell you somebody who lived here. He actually lived out on shipping port. And his wife may have had a baby in 189 down at the Indian Queen. His name, Jean Jacques Audubon. His father was a French naval officer. His mother may well have been of African slave descent. The father sent John James Audubon to America for a future. He struggled because he loved to study birds and the wildlife of the emerging frontier America. So he came to Louisville. He was a Louisville resident from 1807 to 1810. His wife and son lived out on shipping port in the 1820s when Audubon had gone further west to paint birds. You know what they were doing from shipping port here in Louisville? They were marketing daddy's paintings in an international mail order business from shipping port, a neighborhood of Louisville, to Europe. Selling daddy's paintings in Europe. John James Audubon, and look, there are the birds that he painted here on this tree guard. All right, every city has to have one. Allegedly, in the early 1870s, Frank and Jesse robbed our Fall City Tobacco Bank down here on the corner. The Fall City Tobacco Bank building used to have 1940s aluminum on the front, but now we've pulled that off and restored the traditional Main Street facade. From tobacco banks, you go to a tobacco warehouse that also used to be here at this intersection. This is the Todd Tobacco Warehouse from the 1840s. And look what we've got. We've got the tobacco leaf, the pipe, and the face of a human on the top of the pipe, telling the story of a tobacco warehouse here at this intersection of 7th and Main. You can see up on the building, this complex of buildings, the words Meyer Bridge. There's a founding date over on the right-hand corner. But there's also a reminder that the tallest of, this, of these buildings over here used to be the Bernheim Distillery Building. In fact, if you step back, you can see the words in faded paint, I W. Harper, for the whiskey that Bernheim distributed. The tallest of the buildings was Bamberger Bloom. It illustrates the two buildings together, the building on the corner and the taller mass building behind it. It illustrates the difference between the 1860s 
and the 1890s in building construction and in elevated technology. The tall building had a powered elevator that would carry heavy loads to the top. The shorter building from at least the 1860s, if not early, earlier was the St. Charles Hotel, three stories tall, and everybody had to lug their bags up the steps. No elevator. No wonder it had to be so short. This is the St. Charles Hotel, which has had many uses subsequently. Notice in cast iron, the decorative plant. This is the St. Charles Hotel. It was here at least in the 1860s, if not the 1850s. Come over here and I'll show you. Here is a, a tree guard that reminds us that most of us and our families came to Louisville as strangers. This celebrates the St. Charles Hotel, but it also shows a reminder of those persons who came bringing their belongings as few as they were with them. He was a Main Street merchant in the first 60 years of Louisville's history, but he was also Louisville's first mayor when we got a mayoral system of government in 1828. This is first mayor, John C. Buckland, here on Main Street. Hey, this is C.J. Clark. He was the architect. You remember, he was the architect down at the Carter Dry Goods building that became the Louisville Science Center. This is C.J.'s, C.J. himself, C.J.'s name, the fact he was a Main Street architect, and around this part of the walking stick are the tools of the architect's trade. Stone here, no cast iron, nothing dark in the sidewalk to remind us and decoration in brick, but terracotta is used for emphasis. There you see a nymph, a winged nymph on either side of the second floor windows, looking like he or she, are nymphs boys or girls? I don't know. He or she <laughs> holding a jar. And then also you see the lion with wings, winged ears again, small little bitty winged ears with its mouth open ferociously. And don't ask me because I don't know. I have tried to answer why the K is in the very top of the building. Now this is a painful missing tooth on West Main. In the mid 1830s, one of the most elegant hotels in all of Louisville was built on this site. It was called the Louisville Hotel. The Louisville Hotel had a veranda that reached out over the sidewalk with shops underneath. There was a staircase that led to the grand lobby and balconies overlooking Main Street here. It was a wonderful building torn down in the 1950s. Speak of the Louisville Hotel, this building was built in the mid 1850s for a wholesale merchant by the name of W.B. Reynolds. But by 1879, guess who's here? Old Louis Seelbach, a German immigrant, had opened the European Hotel and Cafe. Look, here is Seelbach himself. Here's the knife, spoon, and fork from the cafe. And here's an overnight visitor staying in the Seelbach Hotel. Louis stayed here with his hotel until 1905 when he moved it over to 4th and Muhammad Ali. Well, it's been my pleasure to walk and talk about Louisville's Main Street. This is a wonderful blend of old and new. There's always been change on Main Street, but there's a great deal to know and even more to be known. I hope I see you down here, walking and discovering about Louisville's beginnings and Louisville's legacy from the past here on historic Main Street. Thank you for joining me.